Well, good morning. It's 5:34, right? A.M. Right? I think that's. I think that's about. I think that's about right. All right. Listen, I want to move away from this podium, but I don't think I can. I need you to do me a favor. All right? Y yes. 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 All right. I need you to watch me. If it looks like I'm tipping over, my eyes about to close. You know, you pound on the, on the table, right? And at about 9.05, if I'm still talking, if I'm still talking at 9.05, I want you to stand up and do like <laughs> this. You with me? Can you do that? I need a backup person. Let me see. I need a backup person. I need somebody just in case she drops the ball on me. You got me? All right, cool. All right, that's good. That's good to know. All right, um, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, I had a conversation with David about this. I don't know when it was, but it was in the spring. And I argued with him profusely because I should not be here. That's my, my, my view of it. I can think of a dozen people better suited to start this conference for you. I lost the argument. I think I was on the right side of the argument, but I still lost it, right? So um, I did what people do when they lose arguments. I sought advice and counsel about what I should actually come here and do or, or say. I started with experts because, you know, I am on my own learning curve or journey where OER is concerned. It is true I've worked for the guy a couple of different times who at Hewlett 16, 17, 18 years ago really at least launch the foundation's exploration into this, Mike Smith. Um, and Mike is the kind of guy who, um, if he thinks you're slacking off or you've sort of lost your way, he will call you over to the Starbucks in Menlo Park, you know, and sit you down and sort of go back over things with you until he thinks you've got a clear mind. So I talked to him about this talked to my colleagues about this. Um, and I started thinking about, well, I'll come with slides and I'll impress you with how much I have learned. And I let that go. Then I talked to my comms person, glad she's not here. <laughs> glad she's not here. Well, wait a minute. You know, I have a communications officer, but they, they refer to themselves, this is important, as comms people, right? That should make you nervous right, right there, right? They think about, they want to analyze your audience. Okay, Kent, who's, who's going to be here, right? Uh, let's think about what your core messages are. And maybe we can put images running in the background, something like that. Oh my God, I said, and so you're getting no images from me. You can get those from Jess. Um, you got a lot of sessions. There'll be plenty of slides. At the end of the day, I am more of a conversationalist. That's why I gave you that assignment, right? And so you'll get a story or two out of me, but no pictures. Um, and, and, and I actually have about three that I, and I will sort of back into the OER things that are on my mind in the process of telling these, these quick stories. But let me pause and give kudos to the program committee. The only mistake you made was me. <laughs> but beyond that, um, I think uh, the program and the kinds of topics as I peruse through it uh, you know, ethics, you know, efficacy, attention to underrepresented groups, accommodations for special populations, sustainability, I could keep going. Th these seem like very much the things uh, we need uh, to interrogate 
Uh, and so I'm really happy uh, about, about that. Um, let me just uh, say, as I've gone on my own arc um, into the OER work, you know, I have lived in higher ed. Um, I was a dean for eight years. I am still recovering from that. It's about three or four years of recovery for every year in service. Um, I've been on a school board for eight years. Um, I'm still recovering from that, actually. I had just spent, what, four years in D.C. working in the government, another four years working in New York City running a research company, and my wife called me. She's going to show up more than once in this talk. My wife called me and said, Kent, it would be really great if you could figure out how to do a job where you actually lived. <laughs> right? We lived in Philly. I was working in DC and then New York. I got away with that because my in-laws moved around the country with us. Um, but they were getting to a point when um, they needed our care more than providing the support that they had been. But my wife called it Kent's seven-year adventure. That's what she called it. She said, could you please come home? And that's when I became a dean. But no sooner than I got there, someone asked me to run for the school board. And um, I lost that argument too. I decided to do it. And my wife was the person outside uh, Roberts Elementary School with the sign, do not vote for him. <laughs> he knows not <laughs> what he's doing, right? But I was the chair of the curriculum committee. And we were trying to figure out um, where good content would come from and how we could engage our teacher workforce um, in using stuff uh, other than the basal readers and the stuff that came sort of canned with the sort of, you know, very little opportunity for adult learning, you know, that, that, you know, that came with it. That was really my first um, introduction into the OER world, just trying to work through that. Um, and I think the values of the community of transparency, access, inclusion, uh, innovation, collaboration, these are all things that um, I don't know if you can appreciate just how in demand they are. So let me tell you story number one. Um, I, um, I have a hard time saying no to people, although given the work I now do, I am learning how to say no. All right. got, got no choice. Right? One person I can't say, I'm the hardest person I have time saying no to is Angela because she shows up with a smile on her face, very warm. You know this about her if you've met her. It's hard to say no to her. I'm going to try harder <laughs> next year. But, but um, I sit on a committee at the Academy of Sciences, I actually chair it, that's looking into uh, how to fill the pipeline of STEM majors and graduates from underrepresented groups. Uh, we've been working at it for more than a year. In fact, if I don't run out of here after I talk to go write the preface for the report, I'm in real trouble. But um, as we got into this issue, uh, we decided to go take a look 
um, at the schools that were really getting it right. What am I talking about? I'm talking about um, tribal colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, um, HBCUs, both four year and two year, and a large number of community colleges around the country. We went to see them. Uh, we went to talk to the students in these programs. We visited with the faculty and administrators, and a couple of things surfaced right away. Number one, um, these under-resourced institutions are the very ones where the students can hardly afford uh, to spend two, three hundred bucks for a text. Um, if a car breaks down or a sibling or a relative uh, has a problem, uh, that margin is razor thin. And they get off to a remarkably, and they're borrowing money in the first place, right? They're borrowing money in the first place. Um, the second thing we learned was they, they know about open. They know about open. But there are a set of underlying questions. I'm sure some of you are uh, aware of them um, around levels of engagement and motivation. And uh, the difference these institutions make, there's an intentionality about the work that they do. Um, is they bring this sort of cultural lens with them. Um, to much of the content, they can't find their, their, their own identity themselves in that content. Um, uh, it would be easier to engage them if some of the problems they got to work on were issues that surfaced in their own lives. Environmental justice criminal justice, the interplay between transportation and housing policy and opportunity, health care and wellness, I could keep going. All things, by the way, uh, that we need a demonstrably more diverse workforce in the sciences um, if this country uh, is going to thrive. We, our strategy up to now has been to try to import that diverse talent from around the world. That'll only get us so far, and it turns out there were real issues in being able to sustain that. Um, and so there's a challenge uh, that is crying out for the open community uh, to really go after uh, and em embrace. It has um, not as much to do with getting the cost of materials down. We're headed that way for sure. It has a lot to do uh, with what I think of as open practice or open pedagogy uh, and really fostering more innovation in the use of the materials that are available to us. Story number two, um, I am in the middle of a, what at Hewlett we call a strategy refresh. I don't know if anybody else in the real world uses that, that term, but look, I'm not in the real world. <laughs> Who would move to Menlo Park? if they were in the real world, just wouldn't do it. And, um, but that's what we do. We have, a, we, we, we have a very deliberate and organized process by which we try to look back and take stock of what we've been up to and where we've been, uh, make sense of the moment that we are currently in, uh, and then try to think about uh, where to go in our grant making and the like. We're about to do that in OER. Um, almost as soon. Well, actually, we're already getting started with it before we're really done with the work in what we have called deeper learning, right? Um, one of the things I've been on record um, 
literally walking in the door at Hewlett was to say, look, um, we, we've got to think about our agenda around learning and our agenda around open as moving toward each other. So I went back and checked with Mike and said, am I missing anything here? And he said, no. It's always been about learning. That's where we started. But of course, uh, as we got into this, we didn't know exactly where we were headed with this. Um, Mike, by the way, was the last person at Hewlett, I would argue, you referred to him as a sort of a gunslinger. He could just throw money wherever he wanted to and just kind of see what happens, right? New president shows up and said, no, 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 I'm not doing any more of that. We got to have our outcomes and our goals and our strategies. And Hewlett became uh, known for something called outcomes-based philanthropy. And that's when we really zeroed in, okay, what exactly is it we're trying to do? How exactly are we gonna go about it? What will be the strategies we pursue to achieve those things? And how will we know if we have? And that's what these strategy refreshes are built uh, to create, this kind of profound logic around, around the work. Uh, and Mike said um, it was important to get at these questions of um, build infrastructure. It mattered um, uh, to try to build the capacity um, to license uh, and govern uh, you know, what it means to be open. We have to work on building a community uh, and establish trust uh, and relationships and all of that Hewlett has uh, kind of worked diligently on over, over 16 years or so. Um, there's more work there for us to do. We're not going to drop the ball on infrastructure or uh, field building or any of that. You know, don't worry. Um, but I do want us um, to return uh, to this question of to what end? for what purpose, uh, and how do we use what I think this community in many ways is uniquely built to work on, um, kind of really find out uh, how to make a difference on the learning frontier. The demographics in this country have changed markedly, um, which takes me to my third story. I'm on another committee, on another panel. This one is working on trying to build a set of equity indicators for the nation. Remarkable how much harder that is to do than the committee thought when we got together. We thought, oh, this will be a piece of cake. Uh, there are all these big longitudinal national data sets out there. Um, technology and digitalization has actually made it easier to store, manipulate, and report uh, the facts. Um, boy, were we wrong. Well, I mean, all of those things are true. All of those things are true. But the conclusion we reached midway through our deliberations was that if we couldn't come up with an indicator system that people could actually do something with, what would be the point? Let me say that one more time. Very frustrating to come up with lots of indicators of things for which there's no evidence about how you would intervene. Once we placed that burden on our process, thinking about indicators got way harder because there's a lot of noise. 
there's a lot of debate. And there's a competition of ideas about how to get better learning outcomes for young people. We're swimming in data that shows glaring stratification by race and income, to some degree by gender, immigration status and the rest, language, but um, the knowledge base around how to close those gaps and break the links between circumstance and outcomes is lumpy and pretty thin. And again, we found ourselves in a conversation about teaching and learning, and then a conversation about what we know about the effects, for instance, of curriculum. And it points to this gap we need to close in the open community around even more evidence on efficacy. Um, we're going to try on my watch in the little bit of a way that we can to close that gap, but um, the further we get away from um, the norm, further we get away in K-12 at least from reading and math in the early grades, the less we know. Not zero, but the less we know. And so we've just got to really dedicate ourselves to bringing more evidence to bear. Um, and I think the thing we know for sure is that stand and deliver, sort of like I'm doing now. How much time do I have? I've got to get through with this, right? Thank you. All right. Am I, uh, that's way too much time. I can do this. Um, further we get away from, from the kind of standard pedagogy, the less we know. And yet, standard pedagogy is the very thing that's not getting us where we need to get. It's the very, and so I think um, this is a moment um, where the folks in this room and the community of which you are a part need to lean in uh, on really uh, experimenting and demonstrating um, how open practice uh, and pedagogy um, and can make a big difference for kids. So, Jess, I'm going to do what David didn't do. Um, I'm from Lansing, Michigan. Hey. Must be some Michigan. I should have asked. Let me, let me find out who's here. That's what my comms person said to do. Um, big mistake why she's not here. Um, who, who's in higher ed? I just want to see who, who lives in higher ed here. Wow. Most of you. Who, who works in the K-12 world? A small but vocal <laughs> presence. It's good to see. This is good to see. So I, I grew up in Lansing, Michigan. My dad uh, was a union guy. He was a shop committeeman in, at the Oldsmobile plant. And ultimately, he became the education director of Region 1C, right? My mother was an elementary school principal. Well, actually, she was a teacher, right, for many years. And then she became a principal. Now, parenthetically, that's when the labor management argument started to surface at the kitchen table, right? Boy. But, um, and I was the oldest of three kids, and I developed early on a reputation, I don't know why, uh, for being argumentative. 
I was the guy who would sort of debate the facts when the facts didn't seem to be going my way, you know, weren't in my favor, right? I didn't just do this at home. I had a way of doing it at school. And there were some contexts in which that helped me, but most of them, no, not, not so much. And um, I thought that if I could take the facts that had been presented, put a rival argument on the table, question people if, isn't there more than one way to think about this? I didn't have the term handy at the time. This was a long time ago. I'm not going to say how long ago it was. But it was sort of like deeper learning, right? I was trying to use the information available, sort of think my way around the problems, um, recruit other people to my point of view, some people called me a politician. I did win the race for homecoming king in high school. Twice. I was the representative, the student representative on the Board of Education. Twice, right? So there was something going on there, but often it was not received well, it was underappreciated, um, and my style did not comport with the kind of order and organization in the typical classroom. And so oddly, um, my GPA was lumpy. You know, there were, I was good in civics. But man, the further away you got from civics and social studies, the rockier things got for me because I just wasn't sort of towing the line. I, I mean, I, I actually flunked Jim, you know. How, how can you do that? I went. <laughs> I, that's the problem. I went. I, I went. And this question of how can you do that was the question that my dad asked me. He said, how can you do that? You, you, and the problem was I had a lot to say to the gym teacher, I think was the problem, right? You know, like, I don't want to do those push-ups. How about sit-ups, right? You know, that, that kind of thing. But I think we're at a moment with this new diverse majority in this country where if we can't move off of the standard design to dramatically different ways of engaging young people, dramatically different ways of bringing the information and content to them, ways of engaging them more fundamentally in the experience and use of it, these big gaps, these stubborn and unrelenting patterns so correlated with circumstance, they just won't move. It is not just a K-12 issue. This is fundamentally about the connections between higher education and K-12. I remember at Temple, the achievement gap I had there was substantially with women in math. We couldn't get, or we didn't want to, get a set of young women who we had failed for the first time in their secondary school experience, past praxis 
one. Praxis one, it was about an eight grade achievement level in mathematics. It was an explanation for why the enrollment in elementary education in my college was full of women. They were avoiding the math requirements. I went over to the math department, asked the chair of the math department to take the test, paid him to take it, because I wanted him to come back and tell me whether or not the test was worth passing, and if it was, what changes in the experience he would recommend. Then I tried hard, this is the life of a dean, to get my own faculty to take the test. Don't ask the faculty to take tests. Oh my God, that's the worst thing. But you know, I was, this was early in my deanship, right? And I said, hey, the test isn't gonna go away. And the president of the university is not gonna blame the math department if our students can't pass this test. Uh, and we have an obligation to our students to help pull that off. Guess what we had to do? We had to open things up. We had to create our own content that met our students where they were and work out from there with the kind of scaffolding and support so we could change the distribution of achievement in our, of our own graduates. If we couldn't do that, we were gonna be sending teachers into Philadelphia, not well prepared to work with a population of kids there who had very little going for them. You think about the zip codes around Temple's campus. It would have been like the blind leading the blind. So we're at a moment, quite frankly, in this country where thinking about these two systems as ships passing in the night, that, we have, we've just got to change that. And so all of us who are working on the post-secondary side, got to engage the folks. This, this, there's a small group of them, they're sort of like right in here, right? On the K-12 side to see if together we can't change this distribution. I have one ask, I meant to tell you that at the beginning because I think of my 10 minutes is just about up, right? Um, I'm very optimistic um, about things being open. We're already there. Um, it's going to go that way. There's some things to worry about along the way. We should got to figure out how to work with the uh, ed tech people and the publishers. Uh, we can't, you know, because they just got too much money. They're not going away, right? <laughs> Got to figure that out. Um, the other thing we got to do um, is we have to worry a little bit about the intramural sport in our community. You know, we are, words matter, positions and stances matter. I'll probably take some that you guys should rough me up about over time. But my point is, the more we argue in public, big arguments in public about small things, that's not helpful, that's not helping. But the big ask I have for you, oh, let me pause, it's my, you know, I should pause there because there's no reason you should clap for anything else I've had to say, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, but big arguments about small things is confusing and it doesn't help us see the larger prize. Right? That's a really important thing. Happens in the academy all the time. Um, but here's the ask. I think at the end of the day, the thing that's going to make the biggest difference for us 
is if we could open up the community a bit more and we could get, let me pause on that, yeah, <laughs> pause on that. If we could open the community up a bit more, um, the potential for us to generate effects um, that would really change the state of affairs is unlimited. Um, if I had more time, I'd tell you about this self-study I'm working on now around issues of civic learning and participation. We're at a moment where young people, I worry a lot about uh, whether we can even argue the facts whether we can discern fact from fiction, and whether, unless we're using our devices, we can even get in a room together to talk about stuff, right? If we could just open this community up and bring more diverse players and voices and actors into it, bring more cultural relevance and diversity into the content, um, that's gonna have a multiplier effect on our ability to engage young people up and down the system. Uh, it's gonna have a multiplier effect on our ability to sustain what we're up to. It will extend our reach um, in ways that are irreversible. And so I just ask you to work with us on coming up with strategies that would give rise to that. I'm over my time. Well, maybe not. This clock says I'm good. I, I'm going to yield the balance of my time. I'm going to yield the balance of my time to Jeff. So she can use slides, you know, and visuals, bring you some facts. Um, but I, I so appreciate your hearing me out. Um, I look forward to spending time with you uh, as much as I can while I am here. But then I have got to return to Menlo Park because after a year of trying to convince my wife that she could actually join me out in California, she did. Like two weeks ago, she did. Someone needs to applaud that. I mean, somebody, come on, somebody, somebody got to applaud that. But she told me, she said, Kent, you know, the last time you moved me, it was to Atlanta, a strange pattern developed. You, next thing I know, we moved from Philadelphia to Atlanta. And suddenly, every two weeks, I was in DC, in New York City, in Philadelphia, other places each. She said, Kim, why in the world did you move me down here? if you were just going to spend all your time back up on the East Coast. So I said, well, I just, who knew? But it will not happen again. She has a memory. We've been married 35 years. So you're, somebody else should applaud that too for crying out loud. So she says, all right, I'm going to separate from my pediatric practice. I'm going to put distance between me and my grandson, Alexander, and I'm going to come to Menlo Park. And we're going to move into a little box. <laughs> you know, that's like a, you know, Atlanta. Menlo Park, right? We're going to move into this little box. But you sure in heck better not start traveling on me again like you did when we moved to Atlanta. And I looked at my calendar and I said, that darn David, why did I agree to this? Right? 
every week between now and Thanksgiving, I got somewhere to be. So I got to go back to Menlo Park tomorrow afternoon because my poll numbers are low. They are, they are, they are, it, my poll numbers are dropping, right? And so I got to work on that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be here. I'm going to learn as much as I can from you while I'm here. And thank you all very much. It is 9.15, which is when I was supposed to be done. Pre I appreciate it.